I'm assuming that uh, y'all don't know who Roy's little girl loves. Boy, she was calling for her daddy. Once again, I'm grateful that you are here this morning. And even though our numbers are just a little bit down from what it normally has been, it's still a blessing to come together. And, you know, it's maybe it's starting to feel a little bit harder or maybe we're beginning to feel um, stressed out uh, because we're not able to come and gather together and worship our Heavenly Father together as a family. And it's, it's, it's difficult, and to say the least. But, you know, we can do it, and we are making, uh, making ways available that we all can come together. And uh, it, this thought that I just shared with you kind of goes along with, uh, with what the lesson is. Because I want us to think this morning about achieving our true pro, uh, pro, uh, potential. <laughs> you know, one of the things that I did with my children uh, when they were in high school, uh, even before that, uh, if they wanted to play sports, I, I, I supported them in that. Yeah, Jessica was uh, uh, played in the band. She wanted to learn how to play the violin, and we... We supported her in that. We always encouraged our children to live up to their potential. And <clears throat> Stephen had an um, interest in computers and programming and things like that. And that's, I think, how he got into the uh, field that he's in now. But I always, and even uh, Nancy, we always uh, tried to keep our children or encourage our children to live up to our own potential. And that's what I want to do this morning. I want to encourage each of us this morning to live up to the potential of being a Christian. Because we can do it. You know, the Bible talks about living up to a, to a potential. There are several, several places in Scripture that does, and here are just a few. In Proverbs chapter 14, beginning in verse 23, Solomon writes these words, In all labor there is profit, but in idle chatter leads only to poverty. The crown of the wise is in their riches, but the foolishness of, uh, foolishness of fools is folly. In Psalm chapter 16, in, in verse 11, the psalmist writes, You make known to me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy, and in your right hand are the pleasures evermore. And then again, if you go over to the New Testament in John chapter 8, and look at verses 31 and 32, not 323, but 32, Jesus said to the Jews who were around Him, If you believe in My Word, you are My disciples. Jesus is declaring to the Jews there, you can live up to your potential in the coming of the kingdom. Now, friends, when we think about the idea of the word potential, what does it mean? The word has the meaning of having or showing the capacity to become or develop. And I've underlined that word develop in my lesson because that's what we are going to do. Develop into something in the future. Even though we are Christians of the day, we want to develop our potential as a Christian in the future as well as today. We do have the ability. We do have the opportunity to grow into the... to be the better Christian. A better Christian. Now, there are times that a person may be hired by an employee, uh, by an employer, because the employer, employer sees the potential in, in, in a person that may be a good fit for their country. They may not, uh, country, their, their company. I'm really struggling this morning, aren't I? 
They may not, the person that's been applying for the job may not know everything about the job, but yet the employer sees potential in that person and they know that they can train this person to be the employee that they want him to be. And based on the definition that we just see up here, God has created you and I with the abilities to develop into a better Christian. So if we want to be one with the Son in 2021, we want to look for ways to get better in, as a child of God, a member of His church. And everyone, everyone has potential to make it to heaven, dear friends. Every one of us. But we've got to put forth the effort in order to do it. Now there are two things that a child of God needs to reach their full spiritual potential. And I say that, but really, do we ever really reach our full spiritual potential? I think we grow in it, but we may not ever reach that full spiritual potential. But we want to look in the book of, uh, uh, of Luke. I want us to go over to Luke chapter 9. And I want us to consider what Jesus is uh, saying here to these individuals. Because in verses 1 through 6, we see if we're going to have uh, spiritual potential, then we need to train ourselves. Just like an employer who hires someone may give them training so that they are going to be the best employ uh, employee they can be to the employer. Now, we need to allow God to train us. And how does that happen? Well, it happens through, through the Word. It ha happens through us living the faith and increasing in the faith. <clears throat> look, at, <clears throat> excuse me, look at verses 1 through 6 of Luke chapter 9. Now, this is Jesus. He called His twelve disciples together and gave them power and authority over all demons and to cure diseases. He sent them to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. And He said to them, Take nothing for your journey, neither staffs, nor bag, nor bread, nor money, and do not have two tunics, two tunics apiece. Whatever house you enter, say there, uh, stay there, and from there depart. And whoever would not receive you when you go out of that city, shake off the very dust from your feet as a testimony against them. So they departed and went through the towns, preaching the gospel and healing everywhere. In these verses, I believe that we can see that training was, was uh, uh, being performed on the twelve disciples. Now these twelve disciples are the twelve apostles, which we'll see when we get over to verse 10 of the same chapter. So Jesus is training his apostles or disciples. For what? For when Jesus is not going to be there. Jesus is going to die on the cross. That's the whole reason that Jesus uh, came to earth to die for man. So we see the, the need to be trained. And then as we're training or even after we're training, there's going to be a test every now and then. The testing of our faith. The testing through temptations. Look at verses 10 through 17. And the apostles, when they had returned. Now who are these apostles? The disciples that you read about in verse 1. And when the, the apostles, when they had returned, told him all they had done. Then he took them and went aside privately into a deserted place belonging to the city called Bersetta. And then the multitudes grew and, and they followed them and he received them and spoke to them about the kingdom of God and he healed those who had need, had need of healing. And the day began to wear away and the twelve came and said to him, send the multitude away that they may go into surrounding towns and country and lodge and get provisions for we are in a deserted place here. Now I said that Jesus was about to test His apostles and that's what's about to happen. Verse 13, He said to them, You give them something to eat. And they said, We have 
no more than five loaves and two fishes unless we go and buy food for all these people. For there were about 5,000 men. And he said to his disciples, Make them sit down in groups of 50. And they did so and, and made them sit down. And he took the five loaves and the two fish and he and looking up into heaven, he blessed and broke them and gave them to the disciples to set before the multitude. And they all ate and were filled. And twelve baskets of leftover fragments were taken up by them. What was the test? Don't give up on God. With God, anything is possible. Everything is possible with God. He, Jesus was teaching his disciples, his apostles, what they needed to do and through their training and testing to be faithful to God and not let their faith let them down. And that's exactly what for you and I. If we are going to attain our full potential as a child of God, we can't allow our faith to let us down. We need training to continue moving forward and upward. So how in the world do we get training? How often do we pray? How often do we study our, our Bibles? Just the other day I received a, an encouraging message to me. And it was sent to me by one of our, I'm not going to say young people, but it was sent to us by one of our younger people, a young adult, I think is the best way to word it, and asked a question about a text. And I, I, at the time that the, the message came in, I was driving and I really couldn't answer it right then. But as, as I got to a place where I could, uh, I could see exactly what was being asked and, and research it and, and get an answer back to them, I, I was filled with encouragement because we have someone who is digging. Someone who wants to know something. That, my friend, is training. When we don't understand something, we dig and we find the answers to what God wants us to do. And I was so encouraged by the, by the very nature of the question and the very nature of the attitude of this person that they cared enough about God's Word to where they didn't understand, they wanted to know. Testing and training, friends. Something that we're going to always be going through. We'll learn from life by the trials and the tests that we face in the Christian life. I, I know that uh, I really appreciate all the statements that I received after Wednesday's night lesson. We had 91 people that joined on our, fa uh, <coughs> excuse me, our Facebook page <laughs> listening to that sermon about what we owe our country. And I received a, a lot of encouraging remarks from it. And I, and I did that lesson because it was very discouraging to me and very upsetting to me to see what's going on in our country. And, and, and yet, as a Christian, I cannot allow that to overwhelm me, to cloud my view, to cloud my vision on what my job is here on earth. My job here is to work for the kingdom. My job here is to put forth everything that I need to do in order to go to heaven. That's the ultimate home. Regardless what goes on in our country, God is in control. And, and it's, sometimes it's hard for us to, to keep remembering that. But God is still in control. But there's another example I want us to look at this morning. Another example of a person who, who uh, uh, was encouraged to attain her potential. And it's found in 2 Kings chapter 4. In the first seven verses. And this woman here learned how to grow her full potential. Beginning in verse 1, a certain woman of the wives of the sons of the prophets cried out to Elisha saying, Your servant, my husband, is dead. You know that your servant feared the Lord, and the creditor is coming to take my two sons to be, to be his slaves. So Elisha said to her, what, do you, what shall I do for you? Tell me what do you have in the house. 
And she said, Your maidservant has nothing in the house but a jar of oil. Then he said, Go borrow vessels from everywhere, from all your neighbors, empty vessels. Do not gather uh, just a few. And when you have come in, you shall shut the door behind you, you and your sons, and pour it into those vessels and set it aside and set aside the full one. So she went from him and shut the door behind her and her sons who brought the vessels to her and she poured it out. And it came to pass that when the vessels were full that she said to her son, bring me another vessel. And he said to her, there's not another vessel. So the oil ceased. Then came... Then she came and told the man of God, and he said to her, Go sell the oil and pay the, your debt, and you and your sons live on the rest. All right. In this account, there is a woman who is going to learn, and she was the wife of a servant of God, a servant of one of the prophets. And she's about to learn how to grow in her potential by depending upon God. Now, in the background of, of this text here, we see that the family's in debt, the husband or the father had passed away, and there was no way to pay the creditor. And because there was this debt owed, the creditor could come and take her two sons and force them to be his slaves, to work for him. And she took it to God through Elisha, through the prophet. He helped her see that serving God will always help us grow to our potential. And I want you to understand that he didn't do it for her. She had to do certain things for herself. And so that's what I want us to think about this morning. What must I do and what did this lady do to grow her full potential. Well, she had to be hungry. She had to be real hungry. And for you and I, dear friends, they're, they're, we've got to be hunger or have that hunger or that drive, should I say, that it, we can increase our full potential. When I, was, uh, the, when I preached down in Spring Valley in Alabama, Every week, the elders and I would meet in, at my office. I forget what day it was, but it was around 10 o'clock, and we would go out visiting, and it never failed that one of the elders, he, he was one of these guys that loved to eat. And he would always say, he said, well, we're, we're, through fin we're, we're through visiting, let's eat. And every week, we would go somewhere and get something to eat. And, and, and this guy was a little roly-poly, you know, but he loved to eat. He loved food. And his, he says, I'm so hungry, I can't stand it. Well, did you just eat? Yeah, but I'm hungry again. <laughs> That's the hunger that we got to have. That's the hunger that we need to strive for to grow ourselves in the Christian life. To reach our spiritual potential, we need to be hungry for it. Or have hunger for it. Be hungry for it. Remember what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5, verse 6? Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness. They will be filled. When we hunger for those spiritual things, God has promised us that we will be filled. But what is righteousness? When we read that in Matthew chapter 5, verse 6, what is righteousness? Well, righteousness is the doctrine of God. God's doctrine. And it's only God's doctrine. And it helps us become or attain the state of approval with God. In other words, when we fall, a fully obey God, in His Word, we win or we receive approval from God. Blessed is he who hungers and thirsts after God's approval. Because they will be full. They will be filled. They will receive it from God through the Word of God. It is the idea of this word righteousness. It's integrity. It's a pure life. Even in our thought process. 
Oh, there are so many times that our thoughts can get us in so many troubles, can it? From our heart comes from sin. When we're walking around and we're thinking about things and we allow, allow our thought process to, to concentrate on, on ungodly things, friends, God knows it. And we need to stop right there and ask God to forgive us and to help us. Let's go back and look at that de definition of potential again. Having or showing the capacity to become or develop into something in the future. Righteousness. God's approval. Now, to desire potential, I've also got to see it in myself. You know, we can talk ourselves out of doing just about anything. We can talk ourselves out of, of studying or going to church or, or, I mean, you name it. We can talk ourselves out of it. But if I want to grow in my potential, I've got to see the need for myself. I can't tell you you need to do it. Nobody else can tell you you need to do it. Only you can see that need. God's Word will tell you that you need to do it. But do you see it? And using the example of this widow in, in uh, 2 Kings chapter 4, the desire that she had was for a problem to be fixed. She had nowhere else to turn. She didn't know what to do. And so she turned to God's spokesman, the prophet. And it, that, because of the problem, caused her to take that action. What did she do? Verse 1 and 2. First we see that she cried out to the prophet. And the word that is used here in this text, crying out, uh, shows a person that's in distress. She was seeking help but in a very loud and vocal way. And the idea here, the word also carries the idea of crying out in grief. What would you do? How would you feel if that you knew everything was hopeless? And you owed a debt and your husband is no or your husband is not with you anymore or your wife or the means in which to pay this debt is not there anymore what are you going to do when you know that somebody's going to come and take your children and they're going to make them work to pay off your debt how would you feel hopeless distressed would you cry out to god and say god i need your help i am sure that everyone here would do that I want you to think about what we see in, in Acts chapter 16. Acts chapter 16, we have the Philippian jail, jailer being mentioned here. And, and it's in verses 25 through 32. We're not going to read all these verses, but we probably can remember this, this uh, account maybe vividly. But you remember uh, Paul and uh, Silas was thrown into prison. And around midnight, they're singing and praying to God. And then an earthquake comes, doesn't it? And it shakes the jail and, and the, the chains fall off all the prisoners. And, and the, the, the guard was being, or the jailer was asleep, but being awoke by the, uh, by the earthquake. He was scared. He was fearful because he was in distress because he felt like the, the, the prisoners had escaped. And he knew that if that was going to happen, he was going to suffer torment and, and even death because the prisoners were put in his charge. And so because of that, he was about to kill himself when Paul cried out to him. Now, before the earthquake, the jailer had no desire for any salvation. He was just content. He was going to sleep. He felt good. And he had no thought that he may die that day. He had no fear and no concern. But what was it that changed his mind? Is being scared to death when that earthquake came and knew or figured and thought that those prisoners had escaped. 
He was scared so much that he was to the point that he cried out with, with desire. What must I do to be saved when he brought in the light? After Paul said, don't worry, don't take your life, we're all here. You know, I've oftentimes questioned or thought, why is it that some folks wait too late to cry out? Why is it that some folks wait too late to ask for help spiritually? You know, you can look through the Bible, and I have looked through the Bible, and I have never found an example of a deathbed confession leading to salvation. We're told to make our call and election sure now. Not when we're about to die. I remember a story that someone of this congregation told me. It was about a man in Johnson City Medical Center. He was a mean character, I'm told. He gave the nurses all kinds of problems. He yelled, he cursed, he did all kinds of things. And he was on his deathbed. And as he was departing this life, he was screaming in agony. Telling the nurses, put the fire out on my feet. My feet are burning up. And he passed from this life to the next with those words on his lips. I don't know how to define that account. I, I, I can only imagine that a person that is not right with God when they are leaving this life, they know where they're headed. And so sometimes people wait too late to make things right with God. There was a little boy who was trying to quote the 23rd Psalm. And he began it with these words. The Lord is my shepherd. He is all I want. You know, even though this little boy was wrong in what the 23rd Psalm started, there was a desire in his words. That's all I want. The Lord is my shepherd. He is all I want. How about you? Secondly, for us to have our spiritual potential to grow, we must begin where we are and with what we have and then go forward. You know, growth always begins somewhere, doesn't it? When we go out and we plant our garden, the, the garden starts the seed. And it may even start before that with the preparation of the ground. With fertilizer mixed into the soil. And then you put the seed down. And then you put the water down. And, 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 and then the sun comes out and, it, and the seed becomes a plant. It begins somewhere. Well, our growth begins somewhere. It begins where we are and it starts going forward. Never backwards, only forward. I've had Bible studies with individuals where... Sometimes these people would, would ask a question. And the question uh, was maybe too hard for that person to understand. Now, I know that there are some folks that disagree with me on this. But I believe that when a person asks a, a spiritual question, you take them at that point and you move them forward. You don't need to say, I'll, we'll get to that later on. Let's go back over here. No, these people have an interest. And we need to share with them the answer to that. You can always go and work this other stuff in. We need to start where people are and move forward. That's what Elisha did. This widow lady, you know, she was, uh, he took her where she was and he took her forward. He says, what do you have in the house? This widow had nothing. And that's why she was seeking help. She had that desire to help. 
Now, there are instructions in verses 3 and 4 of, of uh, 2 Kings chapter 4. Notice what Elisha told him. We've already read it, but I want us to see it again. He says, Go borrow vessels from everywhere, from all your neighbors. Empty the vessels. Do not gather just a few. And when you have come in, you shall shut the door behind you, you and your sons, and you'll pour it into all those vessels and set aside the full ones. Notice the instructions that she received from the prophet. Do these things. In the Bible, there are places where we, are, we see where Jesus or others have given instructions for a person to follow if they want to be well. John chapter 2, verse 7, when Jesus turned the water into wine, Jesus told the people to fill the water pots with water and they filled them up to the brim. They obeyed the instructions of what Jesus gave. And in verse 8, he gives further instructions. He said to them, draw some out now and take it to the master of the feast. And they did that. There was obedience. In 1 Kings chapter 17, beginning in verse 15, we see Elijah. Uh, Elijah, uh, the word of the Lord comes to Elijah in verse 8. And it says, arise and go to a certain place. And that's exactly what he did. He, he came to the gate of the city. Of the, where he was told to go, and there was a widow gathering sticks. And he calls out to her, please bring me a little drink of uh, water in a cup that I may drink. But if you go back to verse 9, God is telling uh, uh, Elijah uh, to do, go here because he's commanded a widow to provide for him. And as she was going, in verse uh, 11, Elijah cries out and he says oh also bring me a morsel of bread he was a little hungry have you ever thought about what a morsel of bread is it's just a little bit just maybe just a bite it's a small amount and 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 he says you know bring me this water and bring me this bread i'm hungry or, or whatever and she said i do not have bread Only a handful of flour and a bin and a little oil in a jar. And, and see, I'm gathering a couple of sticks that I may go in and prepare for myself and my, my son that we may eat it and die. This is going to be our last meal. We're not, we don't have anything else. For thus says the Lord God of Israel, the bin of flour shall not be used up, nor the jar of oil run dry until the day of the Lord sends rain on the earth. Verse 14. Because Elijah told her in verse 13, don't fear. Don't be afraid. Go and do as you have said, but make me a, a small cake from it first. Feed me first, and this is what's going to happen. You'll have bread and oil, uh, uh, flour and oil. How about uh, Hebrews chapter 11? Beginning in verse 7, we have Noah being mentioned here, of being warned of the things not yet sent. He moved with godly fear in preparing the ark. See the starting points? They all begin with obedience. 2 Kings chapter 5 and verse 11. We, we, we read about uh, in verse 9, Naaman uh, is a great military man, but he's got leprosy. And so Elisha sent a messenger after Naaman came to Elijah's house. And, and apparently that Naaman thought that something big and great was going to happen because he makes these state, uh, the statement here. Uh, he will surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God and wave his hand over the place and heal the leprosy. He wanted some great glorious type ceremony. But he was just told to go dip seven times in the river. And he was mad. He was angry because he didn't want to do that. But he was convinced that if you wanted to be healed, that's what you better do. And he did. Verse 14, he did the instructions. He, he began at that starting point. And actually the starting point with Naaman was when he traveled to the prophet. 
but he did it. And it wasn't until he did it that he was healed. It is important to see that Elisha did not say anything to this woman in 2 Kings chapter 4 like the part in peace. I can't do anything for you. But he said, I'm going to help you. He didn't give her money, but he told her what to do. God will give us forgiveness when we follow what we're told to do. Just as this lady was able to get rid of her debt by selling the extra oil by following the instructions of the prophet. He started her where she was at. What do you have? I've got a jar. i got a little bit of wool. Well, empty and borrow more containers and, and, and start pouring it. And then when, you're, when it's full, when it's no more, you take it out and you go sell it and pay your debt. Your children will stay with you. <laughs> the instructions were clear. Well, as we continue, we're about wrapping this up. Spiritual potential is living how we're expected. And if you see this, this uh, slide here, you can see that it looks like it's growing. That's exactly what we're expected to do. We are expected to grow. We are expected to, to grow in the Word. In verse 7, the debt of the woman was paid because of, because of what she did with her potential in growing as a, as a person who loved God. Go over to Matthew chapter 18. Let's look at Matthew chapter 18. In Matthew chapter 18, beginning in verse 27... We see that in this context, it's the parable of the unforgiving servant. We, we know the, the, the account. The servant owed a man a, a lot of money. And he goes to the, the man and tells the man, I can't pay you. Please forgive me of, of the debt. And the man does it. He forgives him of everything. But then what does the person who was forgiven do? He goes to find someone that owes him a lot less than what he owed. And he was hateful to him. He grabbed him by the neck and said, give me what is owed. He couldn't. He asked for forgiveness. He asked for time. And what did, and what did he do? No, I'm not giving you time. But he th had him thrown into the jail. How this man's attitude changed. He was given forgiveness of his debt, but he wouldn't forgive someone of a smaller debt. Friends, our debt of sin is paid in full by Christ when we obey and follow Him. And this widow in 2 Kings chapter 4, she followed the prophet's instructions. He told her what to do and she did it. And she grew in what she was told to do and she lived the rest of her life with the oil. In Psalm chapter 81, in verse 10, the psalmist says, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt. Notice this next statement. Open your mouth wide and I will fill it. Think about that. Open your ears. Open your heart. Open your mouth. Pray to God. Accept His Word and listen to it and study it and grow in it. That's the only way that we're going to have potential. In, uh, in verse 11 of Psalm 81, God says, But my people would not heed my voice. People wonder why they are not, their life's not any better. People wonder why it seems like God has, has turned their, His back on people. Well, friends, it's because... Maybe we're not listening to God's voice doing what He said. Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 20, uh, Paul writes to the uh, church of Ephesus, Now to Him who is able to do exceedingly above all that we ask or think. Did you get that? God is able to do more than what we ask and even think. We can do this. It's very easy. And we, we need to do this. 
Because when we do it, as we're doing it, as we're in growing in our potential, our faith will increase. Our faith will grow stronger. And, and as we grow in our potential and our faith grows, our spiritual life will, will bloom out. And people will see God living in us. James chapter 4 verse 2, James writes, You lust and do not have. When you lust for something, you're not going to get it. Yet you do not have because you do not ask. You want to grow in your potential? Ask God to help you. Because He said He would do it. Now as we close this lesson, if you see that little kitty cat up there, that little kitty cat is looking at itself in the mirror. But what does that cat see? A lion. Strong, brave, courageous. That's what we need to be, friends. When we need help, we need to seek out for help. We need to ask God for help, but we also need to depend on one another for help. We need to realize that we have potential to grow and to stay faithful. Friends, in 2021, more than anything, I want our spiritual family here to grow in the faith and be faithful to the end. We don't know what tomorrow will bring. Remember, the definition of potential is having or showing the capacity to become into or develop into something in the future. We can do anything and everything we set our mind to do. And remember, an idle mind, idle hands, idle life is the devil's workshop. I hope that this lesson has encouraged you in some way. For some reason, the screen didn't change on the PowerPoint. Um, it did here, but not up there. <laughs> don't know what happened, but anyway, I hope that this lesson has been beneficial. I hope this lesson has helped you. But if you need to respond to the Lord's invitation today, if you need to make your life right with God, please do whatever you need to do. If it's put Christ on in baptism by having your sins washed away or, or coming back to the church because of, of wandering away from the truth and God, do it. Before it's too late, as together we stand and sing.